I find the running community to be really supportive and one of the most supportive groups of people I've encountered at all. All my friends who I met through running were super supportive. Most people just see me as the woman that I am. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who thinks peanut butter M&Ms are the best candy out there, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 65 of the Running For Real podcast. I am very thankful that you are here right now. Thank you so much for joining me. I know there are plenty of places you could be spending your time, but I appreciate you joining me on the Running For Real podcast, and I hope you feel that this is worth your time too. I definitely feel like I'm uh, enjoying getting to talk to these guests and enjoying learning from them and... uh, I'm seeing lots of positive feedback, so hopefully the same goes for you too. So last week you heard from Max Paquette, who was a biomechanics expert who especially had his focuses on the lower limb and uh, what footwear choices are best. So definitely two areas that we are interested in as runners, and I hope you enjoyed that episode. But if not, be sure to go back and check it out. Today I have Amelia Gappin on the show. Amelia is a runner, cover model for Women's Running Magazine and someone who has bravely spoken out about how her life has changed since she underwent her transition from male to female. Amelia and I are about to have a good discussion about how her life really is and you'll be surprised to hear in particular amongst other things about how her running was affected after the surgery and hormones. Really interesting stuff. I always struggle to know exactly what to say without putting my foot in my mouth when it comes to terminology. And uh, I do ask some of these questions today. Amelia was great in kind of humoring me and uh, giving me kind of some help with this. Um, And hopefully after this episode, you can do better too if that's something that you are like me in. Now, I know you guys love to chat about running topics and having a healthy, real discussion on anything running related. So I know we're going to have a lot to talk about afterwards. I only ask that you do it in a supportive way. Not that I really need to ask. You guys are, you know, good, genuine people. But just remember, Amelia is being really brave and sharing her story here. So I appreciate you being kind to her in the future if there is a discussion that goes on. So after a quick word from our sponsors, we'll be right to the episode. Thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this episode of Running For Real. You can save 10% at bodyhealth.com using coupon code TINA10 and join hundreds of other Running For Real listeners who have tried Perfect Amino and use it every day. Amelia, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I am really excited to learn from you today and just have a great conversation. Um, I'm really admiring already what you've what you've been doing and uh, I'm looking forward to the listeners hearing more and uh, getting to learn more about you. So thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is going to be fun and, and it's, um, you know, something that is a bit different to to talk about in, in many aspects and I'm quite excited to hear about um, a certain cover model um, story that we can talk about in a minute. Um, you are the second cover model I have covered recently. Um, I'm kind of, I don't know why I seem to be kind of going towards people who ha- are making changes and, and kind of standing up for things, but I think that's a good thing. Um, but first, can I, you know, let's talk a bit about you just, uh, in general, you know, soft, you've been a software engineer at Bitly, um, have pr- previously written code at Tumblr and Chronos. I mean, just that alone is impressive. I that that kind of stuff like blows my mind. So well done to you for that stuff. But um, you're also the former co-founder, or maybe you are still the co-founder of uh, My Trans Health. So tell us a bit about what that is, um, where that idea came from, if it was your idea, and uh, just for anyone listening, what that means. Sure. Um, so I am no longer with My Trans Health. So it is former co-founder, okay. <laughs> but. Um, so our mission was to help transgender people find medical providers who understood transgender healthcare, which mm-hmm. is surprisingly difficult. Um, a lot of, a lot of providers are just not trained in specific transgender healthcare related things. Um, mm-hmm. whether that's transition specific things, like hormones or 
things like that, a lot of it's not included in medical school. So a lot of doctors don't have the training on it, but there are also a lot of doctors who are very bigoted and may not want to treat you. Mm -hmm. Um, Throughout the process of building the site, we heard a lot of stories from people who went for medical care and were rejected or did not receive the care they needed, whether it was for transition or not. Um, We heard stories from people who had broken their arm and were asked invasive questions about their genitals or their transition. And those things aren't related. Mm. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to build a site where we could help people find doctors who weren't going to be like that. So we took it as our responsibility to personally vet every single doctor we had on there. So was it you did like an assessment of them or they signed up? Uh, we did an assessment of them. So we'd have to have an actual conversation with them and ask them some questions. And when you're transgender, you get pretty good at snuffing things out quickly Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what kind of person somebody is, whether they're BSing or not. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of that. And then we created a website where people could search um, the doctors that we had vetted based on specific criteria for what they were looking for. And the idea was that we could take the guesswork and stress out of it so that if you made an appointment with one of these doctors and you showed up, you could feel comfortable that they were going to treat you as they would any other patient and they would be able to give you the care that you needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's great. And, and, you know, obviously something that was needed definitely at the time and and even now, but, um, you know, I, I, I love that you were able to kind of see a gap, see something that was missing, something that, you know, wasn't there for you or others. And then you were able to kind of fill it. And, um, you know, one of the question I had just a, a general one was, um, on your website and just around, I see the term, is it cisgender uh, CIS? Could you just explain what that means? I'd never come across that term. And just for anyone else listening who may not know what that means. Sure. Cisgender is literally just the opposite of transgender. Um, the prefixes cis and trans both come from Latin and they're both used in chemistry and throughout things in science. And they're, they're just natural antonyms. So cisgender just means that you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. Um, transgender means that you don't. So when I was born, I was assigned male at birth because the doctor took a look at me and said, oh, mm-hmm. there's a penis, so it's a boy, but I'm actually a woman. Uh, for a cisgender person, it just means that those things line up. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. I just, I'd never come across that term. And, and maybe that shows my you know, how little I've actually researched this, how little I've known about it, but I just thought others may be wondering too. Okay. So let's talk about something that was really, you know, exciting, although had some maybe negatives to it as well. Um, you know, you were on the cover of women's running magazine. Congratulations for that. Um, you know, making history first openly transgender woman on the cover of a women's fitness magazine, which is, you know, wonderful and great. Um, and firstly, you know, how surreal was that to, you know, go into a Barnes and Noble or somewhere and see your face on the cover of a magazine. And, you know, I'm just imagining like, as you checked out, like if, if you bought one, if, as you checked out, were you kind of like to the teller, like, that, that's me. Like, what was it like? Um, yeah, surreal is definitely the way to describe it. Um, I don't know if it ever really hit me while it was in newsstands. Um, I did make one trip to go to Barnes and Noble to go see it. Cause I'm like, I just want to see this. Mm-hmm. Um, And I was just like, wow, like, oh my God, that's me. This is wild. Um, And I did buy a copy in store, even though they had sent me a few copies for my own. Um, So I bought a a copy and I'm like checking it out. I'm like, are they going to look down at it, look up at me and recognize me? They didn't. Um, And to be honest, I'm actually glad that people don't recognize me much from the cover. That was actually something I was afraid of. I was afraid that, you know, I'd be walking down the street and somebody would recognize me and I don't know if that's going to be good or bad. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that person has good intentions. So, you know, on the cover, I'm not wearing my glasses. I have my hair up because I'm running and normally I wear, I keep my hair down and I wear glasses. So there's a little disconnect from how I normally present myself to the world and what was on the cover. But yeah, seeing myself on the cover was just like, oh my God, this is so weird. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it was. It was just like the weirdest thing. Like, yeah. how is this? possible. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and, you know, when they first, I'm not sure if they approached you or if you approached them, I'm assuming they approached you. Um, what gave you the confidence to agree to it? You know, that must've been scary kind of putting yourself out there in that way. 
Um, yeah, it was terrifying. I, so I slept on it before I agreed and I was really back and forth. I was about to say no and decline it because yeah, you know, it's scary. Um, like I said, if somebody recognizes me, I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know if there's some threat to my physical safety because of that. Um, there's a lot of anti-transgender violence in the world. And I didn't know if I was going to be setting myself up for that. Um, I have you know, my wife to worry about as well. And being somebody who's fairly open about a lot of things you know, on my Twitter and whatnot, you can start to piece together places I frequent. Like if you mm-hmm. really wanted to find me, it could be possible. Mm-hmm. So I had to think about that a lot. And that, that was really scary. But I also had to think about whether or not the transgender community needed another magazine cover. Cause you know, we had had, you know, Oliver and Cox had been on the cover of magazines. Um, Caitlyn Jenner. Which you really all right saying that you want to explain yes. why when you say that? I am not a big Caitlyn Jenner fan. In okay. fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a transgender person who is, hmm. we will all defend to no end her womanhood and that she's a woman and that her name is Caitlyn and all this. But we do not agree with much of what she says or what she does. We kind of wish she would just shut up and disappear. <laughs> you know, especially the whole being a Republican thing doesn't really work out so well for transgender people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's just like kind of very tone deaf in okay. a lot of what she does. She doesn't really understand our community. And she tried to speak on behalf of us without getting to know the real needs of the transgender community. Cause her being very, very wealthy yeah, gave her a say. very different experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's been frustrating, uh, for sure. But yeah, so that's why so I you didn't my know eyes. if you wanted to be another model for the for the community. Yeah, because you know, is this the? It brings a lot of attention, and mm-hmm. that attention isn't necessarily good. Like visibility can help people see our humanity, but it also puts us at risk again because if somebody has a problem with transgender people and they see this media, is it going to spark their violence against us yeah. or anything like that. And you see it a lot with the bathroom bills, uh, the so-called bathroom bills that we've had a lot in this country, you know, trying to restrict the bathroom use of transgender people. And, you know, we didn't start those conversations. These are things where basically what happened was the anti LGBTQ people lost the marriage debate and then turned their focus on us because they thought that that was something that, it could win uh, you know, against transgender people. So all this just brings more attention to it and fuels it. So that was something I was really concerned about. You know, is it going to be a net positive for the community or is it going to be putting another target on our backs? Ultimately, I decided that I thought it would be a net positive in that it would help other people like me see that what they want to do is possible, that you can be a runner, you can transition, you don't have to give it up. And Mm -hmm. after the cover came out, I had dozens, probably possibly hundreds by now, uh, people reach out to me and say that that gave them the confidence to come out and they never met another transgender runner before. And it's, you know, wild to me that they hadn't. So, you know, I have this Facebook group I had started of transgender runners. I'm like, Hey, come Mm -hmm. over here and join us. So it's been really good in that respect. And so would you say, you know, you said that you've, you felt like the, um, the pos- it was going to be a net positive and you've just gave us a, you know, a wonderful example of how you have helped people and, you know, made people feel, you know, maybe they were feeling very alone before feeling like they're not so alone and not only you, but now they've got a whole community to be with. Would you say that looking back now, the, the response was a net positive? I do. Um, there was of course, you know, some negativity That's online. It was always going to be. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And there always is. Um, you learn to not read the comment sections online, mm-hmm. but Which for the most easy. part, <laughs> yes, it is definitely not easy, especially when they're about you. Uh, mm-hmm. For the most part though, it was more positive than I expected. I actually had braced myself for it to be really bad and to get a lot of like, hate, you know, on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere online. And it was much more limited than I expected. So that was really good. And it seemed that after a couple of weeks, this faded away from the minds of anti-transgender people. So that was good. It didn't 
seemed to have a lingering negative effect, but the positives kept paying off mm-hmm. over time. Okay, that makes sense. And and it was picked up by many other publications, kind of sharing about the story about it happening. And, um, you know, that that is great, uh, good and bad, I guess, that it got, um, you know, worldwide coverage and, um, you know, maybe not to the same extreme. But Amelia, I'm not sure if you know this about me, I know my listeners do, but I actually, uh, when I spoke out about having amenorrhea for nine years, um, my story did the same thing, got picked up all over the yeah. place. And, and the same thing, it's hard to read, not read the comments. You're always going to get people, you know, insulting you. And I definitely had that too. And um, it is difficult to ignore, but, you know, you've obviously seen the, the you know, what you were able to do being a role model and for others to speak out about their life. And, um, you know, another thing I found about you as I researched you was, you know, you're relentlessly yourself. You don't hide who you are. And that personality of yours just kind of shines through. And it's it's amazing to see. And it's great that people now have someone to kind of look up to and, and think, you know what, I'm going to be like myself. I'm going to be me. So, you know, that is great. And it's so good that you can do that. But um, you know, you you talk a lot on your website, which I will put links to in the show notes for anyone who wants to go check it out, about how being a trans woman is, you say, uh, not exactly unicorns and rainbows. So tell us what you mean by that. You know, we obviously know that, especially in the US, there's a lot kind of a lot of debate kind of going on about, um, you know, what being trans actually means, what you, you're essentially allowed to do. Um, but maybe just tell people who maybe don't have an idea about what that is, you know, um, what kind of thing you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's a, a lot of what it is, is, you know, laws in this country as well. So for one, in many, many states, um, transgender people aren't protected against employment discrimination. Um, so we could be fired up strictly for being transgender. Um, many states still allow what's called trans panic defense, which means that if someone murders a transgender woman they could and then they get caught in their in court during their trial they could use for their defense that they found out she was transgender and basically freaked out and lost control and this has yeah. been used to get people off from murder charges and to me uh, things like that are terrifying <laughs> yeah, um, sick. the trump administration just last week rolled back protections that obama had put into place for transgender inmates um regarding which cell blocks they would be housed in. So a transgender woman would be housed with women um, as opposed to with men and vice versa for trans men. And the Trump administration has now rolled that back. Meaning if I were to go to prison for whatever reason, I could be um, housed with men, which. Even though you've had the surgery and made the transition. Right. I mean, you know, and if you see what I look like, obviously that's probably not going to work out very well for me and my safety. We've all heard about the Trump administration also trying to deny allowing transgender people in the military. And I'm not a very pro-military person, but when you see our rights restricted and things that we're allowed to do, um, especially in America, military service is considered one of the most important things that you can do as an American. Mm -hmm. Whether or not I agree with that is one thing, but when that right's taken away from you, you start to feel like you're a second-class citizen. Um, as I mentioned before, the bathroom bills, having it regulated where I can even use the bathroom. And once you start to regulate public restroom use for transgender people, what you're really trying to do is remove them from public life. Um, it's not, it's really not about that. So you use the guys that it is for the safety of other women or whatever, but there's no history of there being an issue. Like, Transgender women have been using the women's room for ages. Mm -hmm. Uh, This isn't new. We didn't just start existing a few years ago. We've always existed for as long as humanity has. But now there's this big thing to do about it. And the reasons why the justifications that they use aren't based in fact. So what they're trying to do is if we can't use public restrooms, we can't really exist in public spaces. Mm -hmm. Because you have to, you know, use the bathroom, which means that we can't really leave our houses. So it's almost like trying to regulate us out of existence. Um, and of course, there is just violence every day um, and discrimination and all of that. So there is definitely a lot to contend with. You know, when it comes to a lot of discrimination, we get treated, transgender women get treated as women when it comes to being victims of misogyny, but then we also get treated as 
men when people are being transphobic. So we almost get this perfect storm of both of these things Mm -hmm. um, based on whichever makes their arguments better at that time. There's no real consistency. So there's, there's also just like a lot of this unknown when you leave the house of who you interact with. Yeah. As you can tell by my voice, I don't have a very feminine sounding voice. I personally chose that I didn't want to work to change my voice because this is my voice. Mm-hmm. But it means like if I have to use the phone for something, you know, whether it's like customer support, say I have to call the bank for something, I get misgendered. I get called sir constantly. And you can brush it off a little bit, but after a while, you just kind of feel like you're constantly being attacked and you're having your identity of who you are attacked. You know, sure. when when you pull up my account that says Amelia Gap, and like obviously Amelia is a woman's name, but then they hear my voice and they don't know how to reconcile that. Mm, yeah, and and I'm sure most of us don't even couldn't even imagine, you know, half of these things that could be going on just day to day for you and and things you have to go up against, but the fact that you've been, you know, been a, been able to have that courage to speak out, be open about who you are, be open about your life and being that role model for others, hearing what you've you're kind of going up against every single day, um that just shows even more, you know, um how admirable it is that you kind of are being the the lead I don't want to say the leader but like a role model for others so you know I hope you see how much you are you are doing to change things here and I'm I can only hope that things will get better um over time but I guess we never we never truly know so I guess watch this space is is the answer there but let's talk about um running so did you, were you involved in running before or after your transition? Was it something that's always been a part of your life? Was it something you used to deal with kind of some struggles or how did running come into your life? Um, so I started running about 10 years ago, which was before I transitioned. Mm -hmm. It was sort of, I started doing it because I was pretty out of shape at the time and I was not happy about that. Mm -hmm. So I begrudgingly started running. Mm -hmm. I, Hated it at first, which I think is like the standard. Everybody says like, oh yeah, I hated it. But over the course of time, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with just having that mental part of it, that just being alone with my thoughts and getting to like work through things. And I just felt emotionally so much better afterwards. And as somebody who also, you know, suffers from depression and anxiety, that helped a lot Mm -hmm. with those things. Was so, it racing kind of early on or did, was it quite a while before you raced? You just kind of ran for fun for a while. It was, yeah, it was just for fun for a while. Um, and then it was maybe like a year or two before I did like a 5k. And I remember like my first 5k, I wanted to die. I was like, this is too hard. This is how is, how do people do this? <laughs> uh, and then I slowly ended up moving up to half marathon and then to marathon um, as I got better at it. And I gained kind of, a better ability to go further distances without seeing it as torture. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so once I fell in love with it, going further distances and doing more races became easier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I hope this is okay to ask, did you do some races as a male before you made the transition or like how, how did that kind of work with kind of as the transition happened with your running? I did. So I had been running for about four or five years before I decided to transition. So I had been running races. Um, I ran my first few marathons registered under my birth name. Mm -hmm. Um, and before I really had thought that I would ever transition. And then after I transitioned, I just kind of kept doing the same thing I was doing. But, um, once I had my name legally changed, I had updated identification is when I started registering as a woman for races. Okay. Um, and that was after I'd been on hormones for quite some time as well. Yeah. And I want you to tell the listeners about what happened, you know, after the transition surgery with your running and your speed, I guess you would say is the right word. Um, because I think this is something very interesting and, and kind of, uh, you know, shows how much of a big difference this makes to your body. Um, yeah. So the interesting thing is that having surgery as a transgender person, has less of an effect than hormones does. So when you take hormones, that's where you see a lot of the big changes, especially as an athlete. So you go from having these high levels of testosterone that allow you to build and maintain muscle mass to having very low levels of testosterone. And it's fairly common for a transgender woman to actually have lower testosterone than a cisgender woman on general levels, because we take testosterone blockers that just block all the testosterone in our bodies 
whereas cisgender women still have testosterone produced um, in their adrenal glands. So when you take the blockers, they block that as well. Um, and my testosterone level was effectively zero. Um, my doctor actually thought it was too low. Mm-hmm. That was an issue. So w- without having the higher levels of testosterone, you get slower, you have less strength. Um, running still felt the same, but if I, you know, that when I looked at my splits afterwards and my overall time, it was significantly slower anywhere from a minute to two minutes per mile slower at the same kind of effort levels. So you felt like, could you feel that you were going slower or was it kind of, you just were like looking down afterwards, like, Whoa, okay. Or like, could you feel that you were moving slower? Um, a little bit, okay. but not, not that much. It was mostly like, I'd look down and be like, Oh gosh, oh, <laughs> that was very slow. Um, but the testosterone blockers that transgender women take in the U S um, the main one is called spironolactone, and that's also a potassium sparing diuretic. Mm. So you have to pee a lot. So dehydration actually becomes the side mm. effect that you have to mm-hmm. deal with. Um, and it can also cause lack of energy and general lethargy. So you have all these other things that you have to deal with, like these side effects that sort of can change not just how fast you can run, but they can sometimes affect your endurance to run long. I was lucky in that I had no trouble doing the same distances. I was just slower and, you know, running slower and which meant I was running for a longer time to go the same distance that sometimes factored into my ability to run long. Mm. I do know a lot of transgender women who do find it more difficult to run longer distances than they used to. So there is a little bit of individuality to how that affects you. That's interesting because you know, the whole thing about, um, you know, you only need to get to a certain distance where women kind of overtake men in, mm-hmm. in, so, so I would almost think that it would be a little easier for women to go longer, but then I guess what you're saying is, is kind of the opposite. But then on the other side of things that like you mentioned, uh, and, and sorry if I'm interrupting you here, but I'm just kind of going on a thought here, but I've noticed with my, myself now that I've, now that I stopped running for a year, kind of came back, um, that it's, I struggle more because I'm out there for longer because I'm running slower. So you spend more time out there. So it's kind of more pounding. So I wonder if that's part of it or sorry, I just kind of letting some thoughts come out there. So continue with what you were saying. Did not mean to interrupt you and no, take over the conversation. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that could certainly be it. And I, yeah. I do think that a lot of that tends to be from the side effects of testosterone blocker. Now, the good thing is, um, if you choose to have bottom surgery as a transgender woman, you no longer need to take testosterone blockers after that because your body's not producing the same levels of testosterone that it used to do. So the interesting thing is I now actually have slightly higher testosterone than I used to have before. Um, I am actually closer to the lower limit of the normal female range, Mm -hmm. whereas I used to be below it. Mm -hmm. So I did notice I got a little bit faster after having surgery Mm. because again, I had a little bit higher testosterone, but also I wasn't dealing with the same side effects of having to take the blockers. So that, that definitely actually helped. I'm still nowhere near the way I used to be able to Mm -hmm. run. Um, In general, my race times are about 10% slower than they used to be, which lines up with the difference between men and women at the top elite. Interesting. Mm. So, you know, if people want to try to say I have, that like transgender women have an advantage, the data doesn't show that. Yeah. No, that, I'm glad you brought that up. And that is interesting. Is there anything else you've noticed when it comes to your running that's different? I mean, you gave us quite a few examples there. I mean, really, that is the big thing. Um, getting used to wearing a sports bra at first, <laughs> yeah. weird, because I'm like, oh my God, how am I supposed to breathe in this thing? <laughs> now, like, I, now, like, it would feel weird not to wear mm-hmm. because, you know, I got used to that. But I remember when I first, felt like, oh, I think I need to wor- start wearing some support here um, after like a few months on Armand. So that was interesting. And I bought a few sports bars. I put one on. I was like, oh, God, this is so restricting. Yeah, yeah um, they all it's so hard to breathe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it, I felt like I couldn't breathe. Um, I got used to it just the way I'm sure every yeah, I guess that's does true. as she's growing up. Uh-huh. Um, I just happened to do it like 20 years later. Yeah, I, I guess I'd never thought about that because it's just kind of a way of life but it, they are very tight on the like 
really do restrict I mean for a good reason but um yeah that's interesting and thank you for sharing that that is interesting and what about the running world in general how did the running world treat you did it have you had more of a positive response than you know the population as a whole how how has that been I find the running community to, for the most part to be really supportive and amazing. Um, one of the most supportive groups of people I've encountered at all, all my friends who, who I'd met through running were super supportive. I feel like, you know, most people just see me as the woman that I am and they don't see me as being like, Oh, well, she used to be a man. So, you know, whatever. Um, and of, of course it's not universal. There is still some bigotry. Uh, even in the running community. And you can see that in some of the comment sections of articles online about transgender athletes. But I find that it's really not that bad. Like I find it very welcoming, um, all the communities I've been in. So that's been great. Um, I did have to get used to getting catcalled while running. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that was something I had never experienced. So that was something, I guess that's not really running community, but just like external things when the world doesn't see you as a woman you can understand that there's all this harassment out there but until you actually experience it you can't fully grasp just how pervasive it is yeah like you can listen and be told and believe women but you can't fully grasp it and then you know if you transition you start to see this all the time you know running down the side of the road people are honking the horns yelling things at the window um men are yelling things at you. You watch as like, if you're passing somebody coming the other direction, you can watch their eyes go up and down and, you know, all of these things that when the world sees you as a man, you don't have to deal with. So that was a little bit of just getting used to Mm. uh, for better or worse, mostly worse there, I guess. Yeah. And that, that's good for you to mention that because I think you know, you probably, a lot of men listening may think, you know, I, I kind of understand and maybe same as you, they had in the past kind of thought, oh yeah, I can imagine that's not very nice, but you just ignore it, you know, but then you now you've actually been in it and you can see like, oh, actually that is, that's very uncomfortable. And, um, and I'm glad you mentioned that. So thank you for sharing that and, and something else that maybe people can think about a little bit more in the future. Not that I would imagine most people listening are the kind of people that would be yelling stuff like that, but uh, just makes you think a little and and just interesting to talk about. So then, you know, you mentioned there has been some negativity within the running world. Uh, Some of that kind of came about before the Boston Marathon. There was quite a lot of uh, media attention and kind of discussion going on uh, before the Boston Marathon about transgender athletes. So can you kind of share for the listeners who maybe didn't see that? And I will put a few links in the show notes, um, ones that uh, Amelia wants, you know, thinks are probably the best to kind of explain it um, of what happened there. And, you know, um, maybe just tell us, you know, um, what your feelings were when this was all going on. Yeah, so this mostly popped up seemingly out of nowhere. Um, Derek, uh, who does, who runs the site, uh, marathon investigations. Um, I don't, I'm sure some of your listeners have heard of it. Um, he likes to go through and try to find people who cheated during marathon. So he mm-hmm. comes through race results. And this is a thing that he's been doing on his blog for years. He decided that he was going to do an article about transgender runners running Boston, which seemed out of place for his site, but he claimed he had people asking him what his thoughts on this were. And he erroneously claimed that it was a first, it was the first time transgender woman was running Boston, which is verifiably false. Um, but even if you couldn't verify that it was false, you can't verify a thing like that is true. There were, as far as I'm currently aware of and people I know, eight or nine transgender women who ran. I don't know about transgender men. Um, statistically there's probably more. And I know transgender women who have run Boston in the past. This isn't a big deal at all. It's nothing new. The thing that was new was just that the Boston athletic association had put out what I'm basically considering as just a statement of inclusion. Um, they sort of clarified the existing, rules they had for transgender athletes and for how they have to register and qualify. This wasn't a rule that was changed for this year, but it was sort of quietly changed a couple years ago. So was their statement kind of a very like fair statement, you would say, BA? 
Yeah, it was a step in the right direction, but not quite where we need to end up. But so essentially what it was, was that they said that they would, that transgender people should register according to their identification, basically, which is good because that means that, you know, transgender women for the most part can register as women, transgender men can register as men. And and when it comes to your qualification time, same standards would apply. It gets a little complicated because not all states make it easy to update your identification. Some states make it really difficult to update your gender marker. And in many states, um, New Jersey at one point was one of them. It's not anymore. Require you to have had bottom surgery before you can update your gender marker, which now means that if you have to have your identification match and the only way to update your identification is to have surgery, the requirement, depending on what state you're from, is that you actually have to have surgery. So I'm guessing you have to pay for your surgery, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, it, it's complicated. Sometimes your insurance covers it. Sometimes it doesn't. It's mm-hmm. becoming increasingly more common for it to be covered. But it's even the money aside, if you have to pay out of pocket, we're talking like twenty plus thousand dollars. Okay. Wow. But the money aside, it is an extremely invasive surgery that not everybody really necessarily wants to have. Mm-hmm. Um, some people are perfectly fine the way they are, and they don't want to have surgery. Some people do. It is painful. Um, and the recovery takes a long time. So it's an unfair burden to put on somebody just to be able to run a race. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's a right direction, a step in the right direction because it's better than directly requiring surgery, which is what the previous rules were. Now that they just require your identification to match, that's a lot easier. The Olympics and NCAA and I believe USATF all follow the policy that it's basically just you have to be on hormones for I think one year or two years for a transgender woman transgender men there are no such stipulations because they would never be at an advantage as a transgender man if you're transitioning from being assigned female at birth to living as a man you were at you were disadvantaged against other men because you didn't have the testosterone so they don't have that same stipulation, but I don't believe that, you know, like NCAA and international Olympic committee require your updated identification. So that's kind of where it differs, but that's where it's also, you know, where, where there's some work to be done still. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I sort of take it as like, all right, this is a step in the right direction. This is good, but we need to go one step further. Ideally getting your identity, Identification updated would be much easier. You could do it easily in every state. Like I said, some states allow you to do it just after having hormones. You just need to have like a letter from a doctor saying that you are hormones. Um, that's the way New Jersey is now, and that's the way it was when I updated mine. Uh, some states require you to have updated your birth certificate. So your driver's license needs to match your birth certificate. And then some states will not update your birth certificate at all. Mm, it's so nice. it's this, yeah, it's this whole cascading thing where. They sort of punted on it by saying we require your ID to match. Okay. So this was Boston uh, Athletic Association, how they did. And then, uh, but it was, it was just other news sources. Um, The Marathon Investigation article, would you say he wrote it in a fair way or did he kind of write it in a... uh, Um, I I think he thought he was writing it in a fair way. I think he had good intentions. Um, The end result, the article I felt was very problematic. Uh, He had reached out to me before he wrote it. And I answered a few questions. I didn't know who was really what he was really writing the article about specifically. So he just asked me a few questions and I answered them. And then once the article came out, I messaged him like, hey, some of this needs to be updated because this is incorrect. He updated parts of it, but not everything. Um, so it was still sort of full of some not so factual information. Mm-hmm. But it also just felt unnecessary. Like why did this article have to exist at all? Uh, But from there, it got picked up by other news sources. Um, And it became this huge thing. Um, Eventually, AP did an article. And... um, AP? The Associated Press. They are, yeah, major news source Mm -hmm. that many other news sources reference. Okay. Um, And then NPR wanted to do an article, and it really just ballooned out to dozens and dozens 
from there. Um, most were very just like straightforward. There were some conservative news sites that also did articles that were not so friendly to transgender people. Mm-hmm. But it became this really, really big thing for no reason. Like, it's, it's nothing new. Transgender people have been running marathons forever. Um, transgender people have run the Boston Marathon. It's just, you know, we are normal people who do normal things. This isn't really a big deal. Um, but making it a big deal then put a lot of people at risk because, you know, there are people who are very, we're very against um, the Boston Athletic Association allowing transgender women to run as women mm-hmm. and having our names called out. And some sites had photos that they had grabbed online. That would have allowed somebody who actually wanted to do something to be in the crowd, track us online, you know, using the, the racist tracking and maybe do something, you know, violent and attack us. So it did put our safety at risk as well. Yeah. Luckily, nothing happened. It was almost a blessing that the weather was so bad because I think that would have deterred uh, <laughs> a lot of people. But, you know, it's just these things to think about, like, why does this article exist? What are you trying to accomplish by doing this? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for clearing that up and for explaining it and, and giving us a lot to think about for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that we've every everyone's obviously got some work to do um, to kind of, uh, you know, move on in the right way and kind of treat things correctly as they should be. But um, hopefully, things are moving in the right direction. And just to kind of um, wrap up here, a bit of fun. I did read that you love Disney World, which makes me very happy. Most of my <laughs> listeners know I am a huge Disney fan, so I would love to know just to kind of finish up here before we get on to the um, running for all four. Which ride do you head to as soon as you get in, in the park? Uh, much to my wife's chagrin, uh, my favorite ride is the Jungle Cruise. And Interesting I, choice. Yeah, because I <laughs> really, really, truly love terrible puns. I yeah, yeah, they love have them so lots much. Of those on the boat. And every skipper sort of has their own take on the basic script. And so every ride's a little different. And I love seeing the way individuals uh, skippers sort of roll with it. So you're not um, even really looking at the, uh, the attractions around you. You're just kind of like looking at the skipper, like, what are they going to say? <laughs> yeah. Like how, what's their delivery going to be like on this joke? Okay. Um, cause it's like, I know the whole basic script and I know like when they've added a joke that's not normally in there. So I always make us ride it like two or three or four times every trip. And she just rolls her eyes. Like she's good for once. And then she like rolls her eyes. That's like, funny. Oh, I've never what? heard of anyone choosing that. So good choice. And I bet you, you get pretty much a ride to yourself on that first trip around. Cause I can't imagine many others making that their, their beeline when, uh, got all the, uh, I don't want to say glamorous ones, but all the ones that people tend to go for first anyway. Not one of the big names. It's yeah. not, you know, one of your mountains, it's not a space mountain, yeah. thunder mountain or a splash mountain. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, okay. And just to, one more thing to kind of, uh, wrap up before we get to the running for four. If for those who are unsure on how to word things or worried about like putting their foot in their mouth, is there anything else you would kind of just like to wrap up and say to people just to kind of, um, you know, maybe put their mind at rest or just kind of help with the situation as we move forward? In general, Google is your friend. Um, okay. This information is out there. You can Google it. Um, if you are talking to a transgender person and you don't know what their pronouns are, you can just ask. Like, it's okay. a completely okay question to say, what pronouns do you use? Um, obviously, like, you shouldn't ask invasive questions, like, about what's between people's legs, um, which I've been asked many times. I've been asked how I have sex. Um don't ask that. But for the most part, I mean, treat people like they're normal, everyday people because we are. Yep. And if you have questions, yeah, Google is a really good resource. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. Just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor and we'll be back with the Running For Real 4. Summer is finally approaching after an endless winter. And for many of us, that means we have to get our runs in before that burning sun starts to beat down on our head which means early starts and early starts can mean we don't always get a chance to have a proper breakfast before our runs. Although I would recommend you have something. 
Starting the day on a deficit means you have to catch up on fueling if you want to perform at your best. And that's where Body Health Perfect Amino can come in. If you take it immediately following those summer morning runs or any time you finish your run and give your body the kickstart it needs to start repairing those muscles after your run, that gives you 23 minutes while it digests or while it begins to be utilized by your body to stretch, foam roll, shower while it works its magic and then you can have your breakfast or have your meal and get on with your day knowing that you've given your body those essential eight amino acids that your body needs to support and maintain all your systems. Body Health is a vegan sourced, non-GMO, gluten-free, soy and dairy free product and guess what? They have a 100% money back guarantee so you have absolutely nothing to lose by giving it a try. By now you know I believe in it and you should too. You can get 10% off using code TINA10 at bodyhealth.com. All right, Amelia, just four more questions for you, starting with a nutrition tip or something that you like to eat before you run or just something nutritional that you want to share. I have terrible nutrition habits. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I'm not the typical runner who's very specific about what they eat, um, but I do basically live on carbs. Um, Bagels. Bagels, bagels, bagels. Well, you're bagels. in the right place I for have, bagels, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> I am obsessed with bagels. Anybody who follows me on Twitter knows that like, I tweet about bagels constantly. Um, I'm also not above going to the bakery near my house and buying a baguette. and Literally just a baguette and just eating a baguette while sitting in front of the TV. Like okay. I will walk down the street eating a baguette. So I have to ask with the bagels, have you been to the unicorn bagel place? I have not. Mm. Is that on the list? I want to not? go. You do it is. Way? <laughs> yeah um because you know gotta try it out okay all right so that's um, your thing you love your carbs you love bready bready carby starchy yeah. stuff so cool all right thank you uh what about a running for real moment a moment that only runners will understand <laughs> um this is one of my favorite stories to tell but also my least favorite story to tell because it's super embarrassing mm-hmm. um i was doing the disneyland half marathon in 2013 mm-hmm. And about a mile into the race, uh, my wife and I were running this race together. And we, first of all, we just had just passed Joey Fatone from NSYNC because he was there running the race, which was interesting. Um, And then I thought I had to fart and I farted, but no, I sharted. I, um, yeah. So I had to run a couple miles until I got to an actual bathroom and like, you know, clean up. But I think that, you know, most runners have this feeling sometimes of, having to poop and not sure if a fart is going to be a fart. Oh yeah. And I lost that, that, uh, that, that day. (laughs) I think that's definitely, that's like the ultimate running for a moment, but I'm glad that you brought that up because I'm sure everyone listening has experienced that at some point. So you've had the, uh, you've given us something to laugh about because Uh, we've all been there. (laughs) So thank you for sharing that one. Okay. What about a high moment for you? Um, definitely crossing the finish line of Boston Marathon. Getting to Boston and just qualifying was a really big goal of mine. Um, and then finishing in that weather under those conditions was probably the highest moment of running so far for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, From when I decided I wanted to run Boston to actually getting across the finish line there. And it felt as good as I thought it would. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, Especially with things, that weather, having to overcome that as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, we build up a lot of things in our mind and things rarely live up to the expectations we set for them. But Boston did. Like that race lived up to every expectation I had. And I crossed, I grabbed my medal and I kind of just like cried happiness for a oh, moment. Because um, it just, yeah, like how hard I worked to get there. And then of course there was all that press stuff. So there's just like so much that went into this. Yeah, probably some relief. Despite the weather, I had a really good race. I was happy with my time. I was happy with the way I ran the race. So it was just like all around good feels. And yeah, that's just great. felt like, yeah, like that was the culmination of my running so far. Um, mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Everything had led up to that. Yeah. And I love that it was this year. So it's still very much in your mind and, and fresh. So that's cool. All right. Yeah. Finally, what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line of a race? Um, usually I just say, you've got this. Um, you know, at this point I've done 15 marathons. I know how to get to the finish line of a marathon. Um, you know, I ran Big Sur marathon 13 days after Boston. So I did Boston to Big Sur and I stood there at the start, like, all right, I've got tired legs and this is the hardest course I've ever run, but 
I got this. I've run marathons before. I know how to get there. I know how to fight through it if I need to. Um, and sort of that mindset of just knowing you can do it helps a lot rather than if you're standing there with these negative thoughts like, oh, I don't know if I could do this. That does sometimes affect your performance. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you say that. And that's actually what quite a lot of my guests actually end up saying. Um, but it's amazing the amount of people listening who still kind of are like, oh, you know, it's got to be today. You've got to do this. It has to be whatever. And, and, you know, that's why I have this question on here to try and show people exactly what you just said. The more relaxed you are, the more you focus on enjoying it, the more likely you are to actually run your best. All right. Um, Amelia, how can people find out more about you if they want to follow along in the future? Um, I'm on Twitter at early Amelia. I, my blog is Amelia.run. Those are usually the best ways to contact me. I'm very active on Twitter. Okay. All right. I will put links to all of those in the show notes. Well, Amelia, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing with us, um, you know, your story, your life, your just being honest and open with us. I absolutely love that and uh, appreciate all that you're doing. Um, you really are a role model to so many and, um, you know, I look forward to hearing more about you in the future of, um, you know, how really how much you're making a difference. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Really interesting discussion, right? And I would love to hear your thoughts on this episode as always. What did you think about what she said about her time slowing down after she reduced the t- her testosterone levels? It's interesting to think about when there's this big debate going on about elite athletes in the Olympics, you know, those who have high testosterone levels, you know, what is legal, what isn't for people like Casta Semenya. That's kind of where my mind went when she talked about this. But what do you think? We can have a discussion in the Running For Real Superstars in a few weeks time and I look forward to seeing what you think. But again, remember that w- this is exactly what Amelia talked about today. Um, you know, we're all kind of humans together. We're all kind of out there good, dealing with our own struggles. So be kind and, you know, keep in mind that uh, Amelia was very brave in sharing this here. So you can find everything we talked about today in the show notes at tinamuo.com forward slash episode 65. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. And please remember, check out Tina For Real if you haven't already. You can have running advice, mental struggles advice, lots of random thoughts that pop out of my head as in my life as a mother and much more. Next week, we have Luke Tribersky, who is a speaker, extreme challenge lover, including a 2,000 kilometer, 12 day cross continental, continental, can't speak there, ultimate triathlon from Morocco to Monaco. You may also recognize his work elsewhere, and we're going to explore well into that next Friday. Remember to subscribe so it comes right to your inbox, and we'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Running for Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.